Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus and looked to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians, first at Antioch. That's our scripture readings, and is there a children's church this morning? Okay, children, this is the time to be dismissed for children's church. I don't sound now, I'm on loud. Let's start with prayer. Father, I thank you so much for all that you do for us, dear Lord, for your faithfulness, for your love and your mercy. You pour out your riches upon us, even though we don't deserve it, and we thank you so much. Pray your blessings upon this service today. May your spirit fill this place. I thank you for Jesus going away, that he could prepare a place for us, and so that your spirit would come and dwell in us. And help us not to forget that but help us to be lights to this world as you have called us to be. And we just thank you and praise you. For it is in in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, have you heard people ask you before, Hey, are you a Christian? Anybody ever had that? That's a blessing, a privilege, an honor if somebody says, Hey, aren't you a Christian? But what exactly does that mean? We started a Bible study in Acts to go through and see what the first church was like, what the first body of believers were like. And if you haven't attended, you're welcome to come. It's tonight at 6.30. I have more books for people that want to come. And you didn't miss much last week. We just got some organization down and stuff, so you didn't really miss anything. It's not going to matter if you come in. And it's not going to matter if you come in later. Um, what our purpose is is to find out, like I said, what the first church was like, what it truly means to be a Christian what it truly means to be a part of a body-believing church that acts and functions as they should. Because at Antioch, we first find the name Christians, and that's what we want to talk about today. The word Christian today, though, is that a good thing or a bad thing? So many times, Christian to some people is not a good thing. They represent it to be hypocrite, or they represent it to be go to church on Sunday but live a different life through the week. That's not the definition of Christian, so we want to look at that today. Christian is to be like Christ, okay? And we're going to look at where the name came from, too. If you look at your bulletin in the, in the middle, I think, there's a statement that says, Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than standing in a garage makes you a car. And that's a pretty intense thought to think about. Because so many times we go to church, but that's kind of where our Christian walk ends. We're supposed to be the light every day to this world. And when people look at us, see the way we're living, see the way we're talking, they want to see if we're true or not, or whether we are hypocrites. And the only way to be true about it is to own that life, to be a true follower of Jesus Christ, to live that life all the time. Does that mean that we're not going to fail? No, that doesn't mean that we're not going to fail. But it means that we're going to own what we believe. We're not just going to say we do it, but but we're going to do it, okay? So in Acts 11.26, we're told the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Before that, the Jews called um, the Christians Nazarenes or Galileans is what they called them. The Christians themselves called themselves disciples, believers, brethren, saints. Those were their words. But now we've got a new term. We've got the term Christian. Which means, like I said, follower of Christ or belonging to Christ. It also means little Christian or Christ-like. It denotes one who seriously and genuinely embraces the religions and teachings of Jesus Christ. Not just listens to them, but lives by them. They believe the promises that are offered, the blessings that are bestowed. They believe and, and adhere to the commands. Their primary concern is to live a life that glorifies their master, their teacher. 
The first time the term was used was in Antioch. Why? What was different there? Well, if you read in the first parts of the passage in Acts eleven nineteen, it says, Now those who had been scattered by persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to the Jews. Verse 20, Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Here's a group of guys that just saw one of their fellow believers killed. And they were scared. Yeah, they scattered. But what did they do? Did they go hide? Did they go sit in church quietly? No, they went out to, pre- to preach the gospel message to other people. They saw it as an opportunity to reach more people, not as an opportunity to sit quietly and protect myself because I'm scared for my life. They went out and taught the gospel message. Oh, what a wonderful thing that God can do. In the midst of turmoil and crisis, God uses that to bring glory and honor to Him. So now they're out reaching the world, not just reaching the the Israelites. Antioch was a Gentile pagan city. It was not a city that was going to welcome them. It was the third largest city in the Roman Empire next to Rome and then Alexandria. But here's a group of guys that went in and wholeheartedly served their teacher, their master. Death didn't scare them. It scared them, yes, but it didn't stop them. It didn't stop them from teaching and following their master. They refused to give up. They weren't silent, even though persecution came. And last week we talked about that that Jesus said that I will give you a hundredfold in this world and then eternal life. But he said there would be persecutions, and we see that here. The first Christians were persecuted to the extent of losing their life. And did that bother them? Sure, it scared them. Why would it not? But they knew that that wasn't the end of the story, that God's story involved eternal life for them and rewards because they were obedient to Him. So if we get killed, the way they looked at it, so what? We spend eternity in heaven with God. I win. I don't lose. I'm a winner. And that's a hard thing to grasp because we want to live this life. We want to experience our loved ones and things that are here. But they shouldn't overshadow the teachings of Jesus Christ to live a life 100% wholeheartedly sold out to Him. They saw it as an opportunity to preach. Used to, I would go riding with some people and every time their horse would act up, I was like, wow, their horse is acting up. And she would always say, this is a teaching opportunity. So she took even the bad and made it good. And she spent time teaching her horse so that next time she went out on the trail, the ride would be even better. So here's an opportunity for people that were persecuted to go to a pagan land that wouldn't accept them and preach the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And what happened? Verse 21 says, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So if you're obedient, what happens? People get saved. Imagine that. If you live a life that exemplifies Jesus Christ, you follow His commands, you own that life, then people will get saved. It says it right here in God's Word. I didn't say it. It says right here, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And if you read in Acts, you'll see how rapidly the church grew. Why? Well, in my thoughts, is because they were living and owning their life. It wasn't just a church that, mm, I don't know if I want to go to church or not. It was their life. They owned it. In fact, there was such a large number that we'll read in verse 22, news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Verse 23, when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, so there was evidence, he was glad and encouraged them to all remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So we hear again a great number of people were brought to, to, to Christ. Barnabas went to Antioch to see what is going on. We hear, we see what's going we see, well we hear, we don't see yet because he's not there, but we hear of all these great things going on from a body of believers that were persecuted to death. They've gone to a pagan land and yet there seems to be revival breaking out. How strange that is if you're just obedient to God. So he went to see what was going on, and guess what he saw again? People getting saved because of the behavior of of these people. And if you'll notice in verse 23, we have a pattern here, and it's amazing how we see it through Scripture. It says, 
True to the Lord with all their hearts. How many times have we mentioned that already? All your hearts are wholeheartedly. There's the key. They were wholeheartedly focused on following Jesus' commands, His teachings. They were a true follower of Christ. They lived their life to be Christ-like. Verse 25, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. He said, This is such a great thing. I've got to find Saul and tell, tell him what's going on. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. So they dedicated their lives to teaching. They saw a good thing here. They dedicated their lives to this church. They saw the worthiness of the cause. Then in verse 26 we read, The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So where did that term come from? What does that term mean? Well, like I said, it means Christ-like, true followers of Christ. They didn't call themselves brethren or saints anymore. Something was different. Why did they call themselves Christians? Well, this was the first major gathering in the Gentile world outside of Israel. The Gentiles, like I said, had called them Nazarenes or Galileans. They had called themselves brethren and saints and disciples. But now there was a different group. They had to have a different name. And the Bible doesn't say where this name came from, but I'm going to give you my thoughts on it. You may agree with me or not agree with me. And we can choose to disagree and we can still live in harmony and unity, right? Yes. Okay. So I think, because there's a large number of believers, they were both Jews and Gentiles, there was a name chosen for them that would not be a name of division. No longer would they be Jewish believers and Gentile believers. Sounds kind of like denominations today, doesn't it? There would be a body of believers. So what would they be called? And not only is this a body of believers, this is a body of true believers. They are truly Christ-like. So I think that's kind of where the name Christian came from. They were committed to living a life that honored their master. They owned their relationship to their master. And they were committed, totally sold out to him. In that time, and still today, you hear of Platonists, I hope I said that right, and Pythagoreans, because they followed their masters. Plato, or, Pyth- or Pythagoras, I'll say it right, it's kind of tongue-twisting. Because those people followed the teachings of their master. So appropriate name might be Jesusites, right? But we're not called Jesusites, are we? Why do you think that is? Well, Jesus was what? He was the Christ, the promised Messiah from God. So how more appropriate the name of Christian? Because it's not just a follower of a man. It's a follower of God, the promised Messiah, through which salvation comes through no other name but Jesus Christ. So I think that's where the term Christian came from. Now, they were different in everything. So there was a different name. But who gave them that name? Was it, and if you read, there's a lot of different people tell you different things. Was it outsiders that were ridiculing him? Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if I like guns and you called me a rifle man, that wouldn't be offensive to me, right? If you were a follower of Buddha and you called him a Buddhist, it wouldn't be offensive to them. So calling me a Christian, why would that be offensive? If anything, that would be like, yep, that's who I am. I honor that name. I'm proud of that name. So I don't think it was a name out of ridicule. Was it a name that they came up for themselves? Maybe. But they were already calling themselves brethren and saints. Why was there a need to change that? They weren't calling themselves necessarily Jewish brethren or Jewish saints. And now we're the Gentile saints. So did they make that name up themselves? Or maybe it was that God named them that. Maybe it was God's name honoring them, honoring their obedience, because here's a time where they were united. Division was not a problem. Persecution was not a problem. They wholeheartedly accepted the teachings of Jesus Christ and followed Him to the point of losing their life. And maybe God gave them that name to honor them. My thoughts. If we read the rest of that chapter, verses 27 through 30, During this time, some of the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Abagus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This would happen during the reign of Claudius. 
The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Now here's more things that the Christians of that time did. They were spirit-filled. Imagine that. Sometimes we get scared to be spirit-filled. And they each according to his own ability. Not some of them according to their ability, but each of them according to his own ability that the Spirit has provided. So don't say, I can't do this. I can't serve in this capacity. If God is nudging you, not my words doing it. My words don't convict anyone. But the words from Scripture that are God's word might be pricking your heart to do something. If the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart, then He's going to empower you with everything you need. He's not going to say, go do this and not give you the ability to do this. Matter of fact, he chose God or Jesus chose normal people so that His glory and righteousness would shine through them. He didn't go pr- pick the educated, the the godly of that time. He chose average men so that His glory would shine through them. What did they do? I just jotted down a few things that I saw from that passage. They met frequently. They first faced persecution together. They cared for each other. They taught. They preached. They were filled and directed by the Holy Spirit. They had faith. They prophesied. They reached outside the church and helped others. They were in touch with their spiritual gifts and used them accordingly. That's just the things that are mentioned in this chapter. So if this is what Christians are supposed to be like, we can learn a lot from this. This is what we're supposed to be as an individual and as a body of believers. I don't think anybody was ridiculing them. I think they were saying, what's going on? Just like we saw with Barnabas. He was so excited he came to see what was going on. He went out and got Saul. He spent a year there teaching. Because this was unusual. This was life-changing, which is what Christianity should be. They were wholeheartedly sold out to their teacher, their master, and their Lord, which was Jesus Christ. Now, the ironic thing is, is that even the people who did ridicule Jesus, who wanted to persecute them, accepted the name Christian. Isn't that ironic? Because you would think they would call them something else. I don't know. Christian wannabes, whatever. But they were living a life that showed what they believed, and they believed in Christ. Well, that name, again, if I am somebody that doesn't believe, I just acknowledge that Jesus was the Christ, did I not? That's what's so cool. God can do that. They, By accepting that name, they said, we recognize, even though they didn't want to say that, that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. That's so cool, I think. Because you don't see any opposition to that name. They just accepted it. And I think the reason that they accepted it is they saw. They saw their true belief. And it's just great that we were called Christians rather than Jesusites. What do you think? My thoughts. I I love it. So anyway. Isaiah 62 verse 2 says this. The nations will see your righteousness. Isn't that what I just described? And all, king, all kings your glory, you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. That kind of backs my thinking up a little bit. Not to say I'm right again. Isaiah 65, 15 says this too. You will leave your name to my, cho- to my chosen ones as a curse. The sovereign Lord will put you to death, but to his servants he will give another name. So that's another reason that I think that the name Christian came from God. What more appropriate name than to honor Christ, who God promised to us and gave us in the form of Jesus? What more honorable name to say that you follow the Christ rather than just a person? You follow the one true God. That's what sets us apart from every other religion. Jesus Christ is God. Jesus Christ is not rotting in a grave. He is going to prepare a place for us that we can be with Him also. And He's given us the power of His Spirit so that we can live a life accordingly. That even in our weaknesses, even in the perils that we face, the Holy Spirit can pull us through all that. The Christians were united, doing, teaching, living, and honoring their Master. It's so ironic that the non-believers accepted that. It's just amazing to me. And they were united for the cause. They didn't care about anything else. 
They cared about teaching about Jesus Christ. They had saw someone that they believed and followed the teachings of. They saw Him perform miracles. But more than that, they saw Him resurrected. They saw someone who was dead that now came to life. I don't know about you, but that would be life-changing. I could believe all day long the things that you taught me, but then when you died, they'd kind of fizzle off, wouldn't they, eventually? But Christianity has not fizzled off, has it? People say all the time that they're going to disprove the Bible and you can read about it all over the place that this is not true or that's not true, that this is a contradiction. But no one yet has come up with full proof, have they, and stopped the movement of Christianity because we serve the risen Christ, Jesus. And no other name will get you to heaven except through Jesus Christ. So what if they had believed in a manner that was not like Christ? What would we be called? Well, first of all, the movement would be dead, wouldn't it? And we wouldn't be called Christians, would we? Like I said, I don't know if we'd be called wannabes or or bigots or hypocrites. But yet we are called that some today, aren't we? So why is that? Does the name Christian change any? Or have we kind of changed in how we look at that name? And that's my point today. Are we living a life that is like Christ? Are we bringing glory and honor to Him? That's our purpose. That's our calling. And we have the Holy Spirit to empower us. There's no excuse. We just have to take the I out of the equation and learn to serve Him and live a life through Him. And like we learned last week, if we'll do that, even to the point of giving up homes and families, He'll give us 100 times more important things. And then after it's all over, said and done with, we'll have eternal life in heaven. That's what He's promised us. So for Christians, we ought to think, speak, and act in every way that is becoming of a Christian. And to do nothing that would disgrace the worthy name to which we are called. The Christians in, in Acts knew the importance of that. It was an honor that they were called Christians. And they owned that name. What have we got to do to be those type of Christians? And I'm not saying we aren't. I'm saying that we need to be aware of how important that name is. Because people are looking at us. They are saying, does he own his faith? Or does he just talk his faith? Does he really believe it? Well, he seems to believe it, but what about when the persecutions come? So many times that is what separates the true believers from the non-true believers. And we're blessed. We're not persecuted in this country. I want to say that if I was persecuted, yes, I wouldn't, you know, d- disclaim my belief. But I'm not persecuted, am I? So I'd like to say that I would do that. But I don't know because thank goodness the Lord has blessed me so much that I am not persecuted. But because He has blessed me comes a lot of responsibility, doesn't there? We are so blessed. We have an opportunity to reach out, to be the arms, to be the light. So we need to realize and do that. If the name Christian was given by God, and I think He, through His Spirit, told told Saul of Barnabas to give him that name, then that was a name designed by God, wasn't it? A name designed to bring His Son glory and honor that He deserves. So remember that. So when you're living your life as a Christian, you're living a life that God names you and said, Honor my son. That's the name that you bear. The name Christian suggests the beliefs, character, feelings, doctrines, hopes, joys, and purpose in your life. It is a name that should unite, not divide, races, social classes, sexes, everything under one body. There should be no division. The word is only used three times in the Bible. It's used in the passage that we just read. It's also used in Acts 26, verse 28. And I'll read Acts 26, 22 through 29. But I have had God's help to this very day. And so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen. That the Christ would suffer and at the first, and, and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to His own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, Paul, he said. 
Your great learning is driving you insane. I am not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice, because it, it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Saul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray, God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me may become what I am, a Christian, except for these chains. Now, Paul was in prison facing what? Death. And if you were in prison at that time, it wasn't like now, it wasn't a social club, it was prison. You were put into prison to rot. And if you didn't have family and friends that would come by and feed you or anything else, you were alone in a cage to rot. So he didn't know what he was going to face. And he had been persecuted many times before, but did it change him? Instead, he kind of joked with him about it, didn't he? He said, I'm going to speak this teaching to you because I believe in Jesus Christ. And in fact, you know what I said was true and pointed his finger at the king. I think that's so cool. And he, the, he said, Do you think in such a short time that you can persuade me to be a Christian? Well, what that means is, in that short period of time, the world knew who Christians were. And they knew what Christians were. He didn't say you're a bunch of hypocrites. He accepted the word. He called them Christians. He knew that they were living, whether it was true or not, he knew they were living what they believed. The other passage is 1 Peter 4.16. And I'll read 16 through 19. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved... What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. We read about sufferings again. Three times Christians mention it all. One was that glorious name given. One was, I recognize that name because you guys are changing the world. And then after that, we're told that even as Christians, you will face persecutions. But don't worry, I'm there with you. Don't worry, the prize is worth it. If you live your life accordingly, you will be rewarded. Those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. Being a Christian is not easy. You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. It's not biblical. But Jesus said the rewards would be worth it. We are given His Spirit to carry us through. We are to be lights to this world. We are to bear that glorious name with honor. But like I said, many times today, we don't. So there's a confusion here with what is a Christian. Is a Christian one that truly believes what he says and follows his master's teaching and lives that life? Or is a Christian someone who talks but doesn't walk? So as a Christian that wants to honor God,